thank you everybody for attending this talk. Um, I understand that the joining is not necessarily in the field of your interest. Uh, so the good news is that I'm not going through the details of the techniques and the aim of my talk is not really to tell you how to join material A to material B because if you're really keen on that you can find information in my papers or do a literature server. The aim of this talk for me is two things. First, I want to entertain you a little bit with telling you a little bit about jet engines and these sort of things, which is of everybody's interest anyway. And also to give you a little bit insight to the way I think the research should be because you are a research student. So I am using the joining techniques as an excuse to explain the way that I think the research should be and the way that the researchers should look at the, look at the problem he's facing. As the Professor Kuhlman mentioned, we are talking about unusual techniques, unusual techniques of welding and joining. And the first question is that why do we want to go through that? The answer is I'll give you some examples. For instance, there are some materials that you cannot join them using conventional techniques. For instance, most of the composites, metal matrix composite, you cannot use arc welding. As soon as you heat them, melt them, they lose their properties because you are so interested in steel. So I'll give you another example. Well, how do you want to weld ultra fine grain steel? As soon as you start to do arc welding on it, you heat it, the grains will start to grow and you lost the properties. So there are some materials you cannot do a fusion welding on them. The temperature is too high. There are some materials that you can do, but the problem is that you are trying to join two different materials together. One of them is low melting, other one is high melting. So it's not possible to do fusion welding on them. One of them will evaporate, the other one is still is relatively low temperature. There are other applications, for instance, the precision of the welding is important sometimes. This is a high precision machine, a small part of a microwave guide. It is an experimental part, it is highly machined inside. The actual size of the microwave filters are like as much as a book and these are used in telecommunication, the mobile phone systems, not in your mobile handset but in the antennas. The aim of these microwave filters is to separate the signal which is coming to the antenna. A small deformation inside or misalignment will make a big difference to the output of the signal. So now the question is that how to weld this flat surface, aluminum, on top of this. That's all. And believe it or not, there is no obvious technique for it. Because if you think you cannot do any fusion welding, electron beam, laser welding, whatever, because any sort of fusion welding, it will change the profile inside. And you lost. So somebody calls you on your mobile and someone else picks up the phone. Because a small change here will change the signal. So these are the examples. So either precision or joining materials which Normally you can't join them together. I will send this around. This is the aluminum joined to titanium. Very much of interest in aerospace. Or again, steel. Stainless steel. It was a tube joined to the plate. High precision. I would like you to have a look at the joint corner to the precision. That has become one piece steel. Because if you look at the microstructure at the joint, you won't be able to see any interface. I will explain how. So these are the examples why and why we are interested somehow in an unconventional techniques. Okay, the technique which I work on is, is called diffusion bonding. The diffusion bonding, the easiest way to explain it is when you have two pieces of chewing gum, stick it together, it sticks very well. This should happen with steel, with steel or any metal as well, but doesn't happen because, as I always say to the students, believe it or not, you have never ever touched a piece of aluminium. What you touch is aluminium oxide. If I scratch the surface of the aluminium, it forms oxide less than a second in the atmosphere. So it's very difficult to get rid of the oxide. 
So the challenge in diffusion bonding, when we're putting these together, no matter what technique you use, is how to get rid of the oxide. And that is the, today's lecture is the story of my battle with surface oxide. Okay, so when we put two pieces of metal together, effectively we have oxide in the surface. Okay, that's why we don't get a very good bond. Okay, there are some exceptional, you can bond gold to gold because oxide dissolves or the silver. But for most material, we have this problem. For example, stainless steel, you cannot join it this way because the stainless steel has a chromium oxide on the surface. Make sense? Okay, I will present three solution for it. I have this oxide. Once I bond the, basically two pieces of metal together, no matter what technique, solid state I use, I normally, if you look at the microstructure, you will see a straight line, which is basically the oxide and inclusions and voids at the interface. That's why you never get the parent metal strength. Make sense? Okay. What are the solutions? The solution which I impose is that first. Shape change. I change the shape of the interface, sort of sinusoidal interface. Use, I will explain a technique which gives you this interface. And you don't have to be an engineer to admit that this interface has better strength than flat one. Makes sense, yeah? So this was my PhD. I got PhD of Cambridge for changing this to that, as simple as that. Then I went to France and I worked on a different technique which I used the surface oxide to bond and I will explain later that why, how can you use this oxide in order to get a better bond and that was for aluminium when using gallium, liquid gallium. But the main presentation today is how to somehow get rid of the oxide means to produce an interface which is almost invisible. I will show you. So this is how to basically remove. So there will be three techniques. To change the shape, use the oxide, and to remove it somehow. Okay? So now let's start. Uh, what did I do with the... Oh, no, it's here. Okay. Okay, that's the PhD and the technique which I developed is called temperature gradient transient liquid phase, which I will explain briefly. But most of the presentation will be about the uh, modification of the surface because I think that would be more of interest. A little bit about high precision joining using a gallium. And if I have a time and if you are, uh, you would like, I will talk a little bit about thermodynamic. It's just an example of lecturing, that's all. That is not the main subject. Okay, back to the story with the oxide. When you put two pieces of metal together, first you have some contact at the asperities of the surface, but you get lots of void with lots of oxide at the interface. Effectively, when you put two pieces of metal together, the surface contact is less than 10%. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned, when you put two pieces, effectively, oxide's coming into contact. The first technique, transient liquid phase bonding, I have to explain this in order to be able to explain how we can change the shape. i give you a very simple example because it might be very new to you. Imagine you have two pieces of ice, okay? And you want to join these ice together, and let's say the temperature is below zero, okay? We are in the sub-zero condition. What happens if I put some salt on the surface of the ice? Melts. Okay, I put some salt between two ices and then put it together. At the interface, I have liquid. So this is my ice and the ice and put some salt here, it melts here. You have a liquid here. And the whole temperature is sub-zero. So if you leave it at that temperature, do nothing, just leave it, the salt starts to diffuse into the ice. Agree? Because the concentration of the salt is high. So the liquid we had here will run out of salt. Then what happens eventually? 
it freezes. That's why they call it transient liquid phase, because the liquid phase is transient. At the const it the liquid is born at the certain temperature and it solidifies at the certain at the same temperature. So that's why I call transient. Okay, in this story, there is no ice, there is no salt. Let's say this is aluminium and the salt is copper, for instance. It brings down the melting point and you get a solidification. It seems to be a good technique. But the problem is that after, after finishing the joining, still you will have this straight line, which avoids a little bit sort of inclusions and everything will end up at the center. So you will have this straight line and not a good part. This is conventional. So what I did in the PhD is very simple. I put some temperature gradient across the liquid zone. Temperature gradient brings up compositional gradient. This is a conventional one. When it solidifies, it solidifies from both sides because let's say salt goes to the solid and the liquid shrinks into middle. If you put temperature gradient here, let's say this is a little bit hot area, this is the cold one, then what happens, the cold interface starts to move to the hot interface. While it is moving, it produces, uh, I don't know if everybody can see it, it produces non-planar interface. That as simple as that. And look at this. This is conventional TLP interface. This is if you put a little bit temperature gradient, you get sinusoidal. This is what happens when you're gluing two things together. You see that they say roughen the surface before gluing because you're increasing the surface area of the bond by doing a sinusoidal. Look at the fracture surface. The fracture surface of the flat one is flat, and the one which is sinusoidal has got lots of sort of roughness and voids here. And how I do it, it's very simple because I've never been interested in complicated techniques or setups. Effectively, rather than heating both sides, you heat one piece, leave the other piece a little bit cooler, or maybe you can have a sink here. And that's it. I mean, even if it looks too complicated here, in reality it's very easy. You just hit the lower bit and leave the other bit to stay a little bit cooler. And then you get sort of sinusoidal interface. That's as easy. Uh, and that's how we managed to get the bonds which are close to parent metal strength in aluminium. This is when you have sinusoidal interface. I did lots of modeling, analytical modeling, on the solidification. That was like a two-third of my PhD. But there are lots of equation formulation, but I'm, I don't have time and I don't want to bother you with that. The, the results of that modeling is that predicts you basically the distance that interface moves before solidification finishes and how long it takes. This is time, this is displacement. And as you see, all these parameters here, the black ones, are materials property out of our control. Only thing you can control is the temperature gradient and the thickness of the liquid. Let's say the thickness is constant, then you have to change the temperature gradient. The, the higher the temperature gradient, bonding time is shorter. Just give you a feeling, conventional TLP, if it takes two hours, the temperature gradient, it will take five minutes. And it, there is a massive difference in the timing. Anyway, that was about changing the shape. I just wanted to say that if you cannot get rid of the problem, oxide in my case, or whatever is in your research, try to change its shape. Try to use it. That is, that is my message. Because you're not going to work on the joining, but at least you can look at it from that angle. Okay. I have one question. Uh, when you introduce those to the thermal gradient in the interface, yes. So this is only good for the uh, at least the binary system, or it is still good for the pure metal? Uh, it should be binary system. Binary, right. but so if pure. you have a pure metal, you cannot the, uh, the introduce. No, if you have a pure metal, the, there is no temperature, there is no transient liquid right. phase anyway. Yeah. You have two metals, like a salt ice. You have copper and aluminium. So now my question is that, do you have any 
minimum uh, concentration of the, uh, the solid metal? Yeah. Is there any minimum? Yeah. For this technique? Uh, the, 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 that's a convention. In a conventional technique, you need interlayer enough to form a eutectic phase uh -huh. to bring down the melting point. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. For example, if you have too little copper, there will be no melting. Mm -hmm. You need enough sort of material in order to get the eutectic reaction. Mm -hmm. Because the whole idea is to melt aluminium below its melting point. Mm -hmm. For example, this process is 550 centigrade for aluminium, mm -hmm. which is 100 degrees below its melting point. You have to get that one. So that has nothing to do with my technique. That is the, that's the whole story about transient liquid. Mm -hmm. Have I answered that? OK. Now, I'm jumping to this one, the removing, which is the, my main part of my presentation. OK, this will be about how to join the super alloys or uh, electronic components like the one I showed you. And it works for a wide range of the metals. Why? Because it is based on a very simple concept. OK, a little bit of entertaining pictures for you. So we have these, you see Airbus engines here. This is Trent 800. You can see 2.8 2 meters the diameter. Trent 900, which is on the new Airbus, it's even a little bit bigger than this. It is the very new version of Airbus which is coming out. And uh, I don't know, you heard about Rolls-Royce, I suppose. You heard about famous car, luxurious car, but Rolls-Royce mainly is a jet engine manufacturer rather than just a car manufacturer. Okay, this is a conventional uh, turbojet engine fan system which sucks the air, compressors, combustions, and exhaust. And the color shows relative temperature change within the engine. Um, this is a turbofan the new version of the engines, relatively new. And the difference is that uh, this bit is very similar to turbojet, but most of the air which is sucked in, it doesn't go through the engine. It's bypassed from here. 70% of the thrust is from the air which is bypassing the engine, not through the engine. So next time you are in the airport, please look at the aircrafts. There are two sorts of engine. Those, they look like a pipe, yeah? just one piece. And that's the one that all the air sucked in goes out from the exhaust. If you look at the new air buses, you will see that there, this part of the engine, even you, if you, when you're climbing the aircraft, you will see that you can see through. You can see the light is going through this bit. That's the turbofan. So only 30% of the thrust is through the engine. The rest is through the bypass which is difficult to believe it, but that's the way it is because the amount of the air you get at this radius is much more than what you get inside. So the whole idea about the engine is to, to make it this rotate. Okay, and uh, the bit which I work on it, this, these are the titanium ones. This bit is also titanium, but this bit which much smaller blades are the nickel base super alloy and a little bit stainless steel and heat resistant steel, it will be at the end. Anyway, this will shows the, how the material distributed in the wet within the engine. As you see, the most of it titanium. Uh, okay, the steel is very important, and this is the bit of the steel. Although relatively, it's shown little, but it's not. This is the main shaft which takes the whole load in the center. It has to be high strength steel, and then we have these hot areas which are basically nickel and a little bit of aluminium composite, etc. Yeah, also this one shows what I mean by turbofan. You see, this is the bypass which is coming from here, and 30% of the thrust is through the engine. Uh, if you look at the pressure, massive change, suddenly from almost atmospheric pressure to 40 bar. 40 atmospheric pressure means like a 20 times pressure in the, in the tire of your car, and look at the temperature increase from minus, God knows, minus 50, 60 centigrade up to 1500 within fraction of second. And this shows the distribution of the temperature and the pressure on a blade, which I'm not bothering you with you. And if you look at what is the best material at that temperature, you don't have that much choice because the rest of the material, they go soft. 
at such a high temperature. And if you look at the so heat resistant material, you will see that the, the nickel based super alloys basically, these ones, and the newer generations, these ones, are, are the best candidate. Let me give you some sort of feeling. The temperature of the gas which is coming out, it's, it's well above the melting point of the blade. But the blade doesn't melt. Why? It's like you have a chocolate bar and put it in front of your hair dryer. It melts immediately, but the blades don't melt. Why? Anybody knows? I mean that this blade melts at, let's say, 1500 centigrade. The temperature of the gas is 1800. The answer is that because it has got a cooling system. So it's like you drill the hole into the chocolate and then you, you know. So when I'm on the aircraft, the passenger next to me, it worries about the temperature of the champagne or so I said, okay, there's more important things to worry about it. Because if one of, the, one of these channels blocks just one of them, this blade will melt immediately because it's an environment, as I said, the temperature is much higher. So one of the tricks is to have these channels or they coat them. Okay, this is interesting numbers. I mean, look at that 50 years jet engine we have. The early ones, the temperature was very low. Now we are here. This is the gas temperature which is heating the engine blades. But the designer, they want to increase the temperature. Anybody knows why we want to increase the temperature of the engine? Because Thank you very much. But that's the basic law in, in the thermodynamic that the, in the thermal engines, if you increase the temperature, you increase the efficiency. The fuel consumption will go down. Okay, in order to go to that temperature, you have to change the material. You need a better material. But let, let's look at the situation with material. Thanks to the computing system, it takes for Rolls-Royce only 18 months, one and a half years, to design a brand new engine. It's a relatively short time. I mean, you, you ask them, this is the engine I want. They come up with a new engine for you on the board in, in a year or year and a half. It takes five to ten years to produce one new super alloy. In fact, not, not one person. I mean, you need a big research center ten years to get one new material. So you see that the material development is far slower than, than the design. So this shows that importance of the joining. Entity. The project which I worked on it was called Cambridge Advanced Method for Joining engine turbines. Um, the idea was that rather than making the whole turbine from the expensive alloy in order to increase the temperature, let's make this bit from a high quality super alloy and the rest from the lower one. So the idea is shown here is schematically basically. If this is the blade, you don't have to have a high quality super alloy here, but here is the hot bit. So we can have, for example, directionally solidify alloy here and the conventional one here. That is the whole idea of joining to this symbol element. Make sense? Okay. This is the story about the oxide, which I mentioned. Kasakov is, is supposed to be the father of diffusion bonding. He says all metals can be joined if clean surface brought together within the range of interatomic forces. Okay, interatomic forces, a bit difficult, but a bit of pressure and heat, you can solve this problem. But the problem is here, clean. How we can clean the surface? You know super alloys, stainless steel, aluminium. They all have very protective oxide layer, agree? The technique which I came up with it, it was extremely simple. Let's say I have a piece of emery paper. If I put a little bit liquid gallium on it, very little, and just rub on the surface, as easy as that. That's all. It will remove the oxide from the surface. You can always remove the oxide. But because the gallium sits on the surface, there is no chance for the chromium or the aluminium oxide to reform on the surface continuously. At least not continuously, because you're replacing it with different metal. Okay? 
So effectively what we have here, you have an oxide layer which is 10 to 10, 4 to 10 micron for aluminium and if you do this surface treatment which is very extremely simple, you, in theory you end up with something, okay you have that new metal which is let's say gallium, you have some oxide from the previous surface oxide but it will not be continuous. It makes the surface very bonding friendly. These are the only direct proof I have. You see that this is the this is the surface analysis we've done in the University of Surrey. And you see that the chromium oxide is here on the as polished inconel. But after doing treatment, the oxide disappears. And that's the result. See? This is the inconel, uh, it's the cobalt based, sorry, alloy which is joined and then you won't be able to see any, any interface. The first time I looked at this, to be honest, I thought I cut the sample at the wrong direction. So I broke the mounting and then looked at it. They said, yes, you can't really see it because the surface, the oxide, is, is not as continuous as it used to be. This is the, another alloy, nickel super alloy. There is a, maybe this is the part of the bond line, maybe not but that's what you see. If you do an EDX, you won't be able to see that much difference. The reason because the amount of the gallium is so little and the bonding temperature is high. So nothing, it, whatever it is there, it's less than the detection limit of our equipment. Okay, when you do the directionally solidify, then you will be able to see the bond line because of course, these, the grains are not in the same sort of alignment, so then you will be able to see the bond line here. And this is the single crystal. I tried to align it, but anyway, whatever I do, I will have this misalignment somehow. So that's easier to see here because of misalignment, not because of the interface. And it can be used for the sort of, to this similar material, to nickel base and cobalt base. And these are the results of the bending test. Uh, I would like to pass this around. Um, uh, this blue sample, all of them are super alloys, which are bent, sliced very thin, and they twisted to show that there is no bond line is visible. You can, if you bend them, no matter which way you bend it, they will behave like a single material. So these are the tests. Of course, this is a metallography sample. We can't see it because we don't have microscope. And these are the other aluminum alloys. I just passed this around. Then you can have a look at it from here. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. So this shows that the mechanical property is as good as we expect from the, uh, from the microstructures. And then we did some room temperature tensile test. You see the parent alloy here compared to the bonded one. Bond line are here and here somewhere, but it is necking away from bond line. It's just like a one piece metal. This is a bit like you're getting close to the story with the chewing gum. Because as soon as you stick the chewing gum together, you try to separate them together, you won't be able. So it's quite promising. And then this is the high temperature test we did. Uh, it necked, but it didn't break. But these all are, they don't make sense unless we prove it in a high temperature cryptos because that is the ultimate test. And this is the most recent results we have. You have Inconel 718 here and Inconel 600. For your information, Inconel 718 has got much better crypt life. And this is the joint and as you see there are some cracks and voids in Inconel 600 and the joint is still there. All our creep samples fail away from the joint and within the superalloy which has got a lower grade, basically lower strength. 33 hours at the temperature and things. This is quite assuring that the, the diffusion bonding is working. Okay, back to the story with, the, with uh, this high precision joining. Yeah? It's a little bit different. I just explain it and then go back to the other one. The technique which I used is very, si very simple. In, it, I developed it in France. 
Actually, I had, there was a French professor. He always wanted to join aluminium with gallium. And the reason it's, is that because gallium melts in room temperature, not only melts in room temperature, but also brings down the melting point of gallium to room temperature. Isn't it ideal? You have a metal which you put on the gallium, it melts in the room temperature and they stick it together, it becomes one piece. But the problem is that, unfortunately I cannot demonstrate here because I didn't bring liquid gallium with me, is that if you put aluminium into liquid gallium in room temperature, it's something like you putting your biscuit into the cup of tea. <laughs> I mean, you keep the aluminium into the gallium, take it out, and then you can easily break it because gallium goes to between the grains and completely destroys the aluminium. That's the problem. So as soon as you put the gallium here, it's gone. You lose the mechanical property of aluminium. You can regain it by heat treatment, but it doesn't help. So what I did in France, just briefly to mention, is that I said, okay, we have a gallium, but what about using the aluminium oxide to protect the gallium, to protect the aluminium from gallium? As easy as that. So the people who worked before me, they all clean the surface. Because this is just one dimensional way of thinking. We always think that cleaning the surface in joining is good. No, it wasn't good. The problem was that they cleaned the surface and they rubbed the gallium on the surface. And they never got it right. What I did is very simple. I just put the gallium on the surface making sure not to scratch the surface. So gallium stays on aluminium, nothing happens. It doesn't go through the oxide because oxide is quite protective. And then put two pieces together slowly and then heat it fast. When you heat it fast, gallium breaks through the oxide and it forms a very good bond. And that's how we join this basically. So that's what I meant by using the... Effectively, oxide helps you to join the component together. Anyway, so, yeah, in the microwave filters, any small sort of fillet formation undercut, it affects the quality of the microwave guide, so that's why you can't use a brazing system. These are also the tests we have done on the aluminium, as you see they are breaking from. I, I mean, those who, I guess you are not familiar with the diffusion bonding aluminium. Diffusion bonding aluminium is a very difficult thing because aluminium oxide. So these are the very first samples which have such a good strength, I think. And I'll show you, I'll send this around as well. This is uh, aluminium joined to titanium, similar technique. You see, this is the project which I did for aerospace. I don't know whether you work with, uh, with the industry or not. In academia, you produce one joint, one nice micrograph, you write a one nice paper, you can get a prize. When you are working with Rolls-Royce, you produce 99 samples, perfect, one of them is not, they are not interested anymore. It's a different world, really different world. It's a big limp from academic work to the industrial work, particularly when you're working with the serious people like those who, you know, design and certified engine, it's very difficult to convince them. So the reliability is very important. I mean, even they don't like to see this, which is lower than this. They say, why? Why this is lower? And this sort of thing. Okay, this is the height of the, height of the, basically, my presentation, which I is showing here. I mean, this is a nickel-based single crystal clean the surface and join to another nickel. Then I took it out, I joined inconel to it, which is lower grade. Then I joined cobalt on top of that. Cobalt cleaned, joined stainless steel, and the stainless steel to titanium, and the titanium to aluminium, aluminium to aluminium metal matrix. And that the way that I said, because Although these materials are different, but they are in common terms of the surface oxide. If you remove surface oxide of these materials, you will be able to, to join them in solid state. So this is the conclusion that I just mentioned, the alloys you can bond using this technique. And just trying to say that uh, 
the understanding of the mechanism is very important. If you're going to do a research, I'm not saying that you shouldn't believe what the people said before you, but try to, to be radical sometimes, you know? Try to question why you're doing this. Yeah? Why they didn't do that, why they did that. That's very important. That will be a sort of real new research. Or you can do a research, just do whatever they did, change the condition, parameters, publish a paper. That's one approach. Nothing wrong with it. You will get your PhD. But if you want to do something really new, that you can say, oh, this is my work. You have to think radically. So that's very important. Okay, and I think joints are very important in our life. Uh, I hope GIFT will sometimes consider having a joining lab here, <laughs> <laughs> still, because they say one uh, out of two or three of, three or four of us is going to have an artificial hip. So that's quite scary. I mean, I mean, let's say if we are, I don't know how many we are, four or five of us will have this anyway. So joining becomes very important. Yes, Eiffel Tower was a masterpiece of joining. It was built when there was no arc welding at all. If you see any arc welding next time you visit the Eiffel Tower, because they've done it afterwards. There is no, weld, no arc welding here at all. This is your bridge, I suppose. So joining is very important. And in the business, joining is important. Most things, they break from their joints. Isn't it true? So we have to look after the joints, no matter which kind of joint. So you have to really look after it. That's very, pretty important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a very short talk about thermodynamics. The reason I did that because I thought maybe to present the, how to I present the simple ideas to my students, but I don't know whether it's in the it's of an interest here or not. I don't know. Anybody here likes thermodynamics or hates thermodynamics? <laughs> the, rest, the rest can go. I just want to have those who, are, who love it or hate it. They hate it. No. So, you hate it? Yeah, <laughs> interest to you, but thermodynamic, it should be of interest to all of us. But I would like to mention my, my sort of point of view about simple thermodynamic laws. Uh, where should I click here? Okay, law of the laws. You all right? Okay. The first question is that, let's say you know nothing about thermodynamics. Yeah, we're just looking at the different angle to it. Some of the reactions are always spontaneous. Agree? Objects fall down, rivers run down, buildings collapses, tires explode, food rots. But it never happens the other way around. This is very important. Why? Anybody knows why? Why never goes the other way around? Why we can't just pour some concrete and iron beam somewhere hoping that it makes a building? No, really. Any, anybody wants to comment on that? Any of the students? It's a very simple idea, isn't it? It seems that nature by nature is lazy. Means wants to decrease its internal energy. The reason things drop, because it reduces its internal energy. It never goes the other way around, because that would be increasing. Okay? So, in somehow we can call it enthalpy, or whatever you like to call it. So it seems that these things happen because it reduces the enthalpy, internal system. Agree? Is it okay, you think? It's not because there are some exceptions. I mean, if we can say that, okay, that's the way nature works, because the entropy goes down, okay, let's go home, finished. We have the, we have the equation which explains why things happened. But there are some exceptions. That's where the trouble starts. Okay, I have boxes with two different gas inside. 
Let's say the atomic size, everything, interactions are the same. Yeah? If I remove the membrane here, what happens? Mix up. Mixes up. Thank you. And that's the spontaneous reaction. Okay? So, the enthalpy of the system has not changed. It is zero. Okay? So why this is happening? Sorry? So I, I don't know what entropy is. Can you make it simple? Let's say you are explaining this to your 12 years old sister. And your sister say, why this is happening? Why they should? There is no difference between this atom and that atom, but they all mix. Why? Yes, I agree. Your answer is completely right. Entropy. But can you make it simpler? I, I'm, I'm always interested in the very simple concepts. Why? This condition is more natural. More natural. <laughs> yeah, but then I would ask her what natural is. You don't like to stay together. Sorry? You don't like to stay, sit, sit together. You don't, like, you don't want to stay together. You want to mix together. They want to mix together. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> That's very true. All, all answers are correct. All answers are correct. Yeah. So there is something which drives the reaction. Okay, then the question is that why it doesn't go other way around? It never happens. Happens? Okay, let's think about it and I'll explain it a bit more. Are we missing a point? It seems we are missing, yeah? There is something in nature which takes you from here here, but never goes this way. But we can't explain it that easily. Okay, how we can solve this problem? You see, we have two states of material, this one and this one, and I cannot explain why this is happening. So what I do, I go and bring a mathematician. I bring one of those mathematicians which are very one-dimensional. Have you seen some of these scientists are very one-dimensional? No, really. I mean, they just see their, their, their work and their subject, and that, that's great. I mean, you need one of those mathematicians which sees everything from his single angle. And that's good sometimes. So we will bring a mathematician and say, OK, what, what, what do you see here that helps us to explain this happening? Mathematician looks at it and says, this is two different states of materials. State A, state B. And say, oh, thank you very much. But what else? I mean, what, what else you can see here? And the mathematician looks at it and says, nothing that much, just two states of the material, no difference. And then we insist that, OK, a little bit say more. Mathematician says, nothing that much, but this is more probable, and this is less probable. <laughs> he doesn't even say possible or impossible. He says probable or improbable. And that is the key. That's the time you have to pay him, and he can go. Because the problem solved somehow. This is an interesting thing. Left to itself, the system goes to maximum disorder. I don't know if you noticed or not. You clean your desk, you clean your room. It, makes, it takes effort. But you never need effort <laughs> to make it clutter again. This, this is really something in nature, yeah? So next time your parents are I don't know, angry with you or saying, that, oh, you don't clean your room. All you have to say that by nature, let's do itself, it goes to maximum order. Effectively, when your room is cluttered, it's in the more natural sort of state. And what the mathematician said, this is what we see easily. The things go disorder from our room. But this is what the mathematician said. That alone goes to the maximum probability. So the, if we go and look at your rooms now, most likely your rooms, in average, will be at the maximum disorder. It's very unlikely we find all your rooms clean and tidy and everything. I'm not saying impossible, because remember, mathematician didn't say possible, impossible. <laughs> mathematician said probable or improbable. So, the answer is that, yes, it is possible to go from to that, 
but it is very very slim chance that happens okay who we need that he this is my favorite thermodynamic equation why and this is also my favorite thermodynamic man Boltzmann Boltzmann was very pro-atomistic person he was trying to prove that uh, material is made from atoms and we should be able to predict its behavior from atom, atoms behavior so his immortal equation is so important thermodynamic, thermodynamic. why? because it is relating something which is sensible entropy, something which is measurable you can go and measure it okay? entropy to something which is in atomic scale probability I mean you have you bring a mathematician and tell him okay we have 10 green 10 red he immediately calculates the probability for you this is a bit of equation that we have a very good tool and it's done by mathematicians you give the sides number of the number of the atoms and they calculate you like this you know because it's pure maths this is pure maths but this is a thermodynamic part and that's the magic about his equation I have used the exactly same sort of characters which is written on his tomb this is in Vienna cemetery so rather than putting his name I think they just put his equation it's more famous than this okay so you see that's very important because by looking at the behavior of the atoms you can predict the sort of macroscopic property which is the entropy effectively now we can explain why this is happening because it is more likely to have this state than that state that's why the gas will mix together okay now you said entropy can you tell me somebody tells me what entropy is roughly I mean not in the atomic scale what it means the degree of randomness Think of randomness. What is the effect of entropy in our life? Any idea? Okay. Um, give you an example. When, we know that from thermodynamic that when you burn the fuel to move your car, you can never have a hundred percent efficiency. Anybody knows why? You cannot have an engine which has got hundred percent efficiency because part of the energy when you converting it goes for entropy okay so now this is the this is the point that I have to discriminate between the forms of energy we have high quality energy in nature and low quality energy the low quality energy is like heat because it's random it's not organized high quality is the fuel when you buy it because it's a chemical bond and those are just not random basically the atoms are in the certain place to make a fuel for you you burn it you get some mechanical sort of force from it and the rest goes as a heat which is the low quality of the low quality form of the energy basically so that is what I mean by high quality, like a mechanical work, like a fuel. These are the high quality ones. And the low quality or disorganized energy is heat, like entropy. That's why when you're changing something high quality, you cannot change it 100% to another high quality form of energy. You have to give away some heat. And that is the entropy. I mean, philosophical point of view is that, that you always lose when you're changing energy energy doesn't disappear but it is not accessible there is a part of energy in the nature which is not accessible chemical, the food which I had lunch time burning in my body and I am moving this is the mechanical movement but I am losing the heat behind that is the entropy okay now we can have the equation it was not only delta H but it was also entropy so things happen if this is negative 
Now the tool is finished. It's at the constant temperature and pressure. So that's why we call it free energy, means the energy which is available. This is what you have, this is what you lose, this is what is available to you. That's the definition of it. It's got lots of application, you know better than me. I mean you can look at the free energy and then predict what sort of phase you have. These are the obvious. Or the best example is Ellingham diagram, you know better than me, that the free energy defines which. But also please remember that that equation is a tool, it's not a law. Yeah, you must be very careful. Constant temperature, constant pressure. Pressure, pressure, temperature changes, that equation is not valid anymore. Okay, let's summarize it. First law. Agree everybody with this? Okay, this is what you write in the exam papers. Or energy cannot be created or destroyed. Concept. Okay, I make it a little bit that the equation that you put, I mean, does not matter? Or this is the practical aspect of the story. You can never make a machine with 100% efficiency. And this is my interpretation of the first law. You don't get something for nothing. You must always pay for it. The second law, now we can explain because we know what entropy is. Please read it. We cannot have something which takes the heat and gives you the mechanical movement. Because heat is a low grade. You cannot transform a low grade form of energy to 100% high grade energy. That's what you have to lose. And this is the equation, which means you always have the entropy positive and mechanical terms for an impossible to have a machine which is 100% efficient, let alone impossible to make a machine. This is the machine which burns nothing. This is the machine which gives you 100% mechanical sort of output or efficiency. That's second law. I'm sorry, oh, did I have missed something? Yes, that's my, you don't even get as much as you pay for it. That's the law of the life. When you, when you spend some money to buy a sandwich, you never, the value of the sandwich is not as much as the money you're paying. It cannot be, because if it was, why the seller selling it to you? I mean, that's, that's, that makes sense. So the nature is not, going to, you, is not going to allow you, you put a sort of, I don't know, one megacalorie fuel into your car and get one megacalorie mechanical force. It's not going, because if it happens, why the engine is moving? Why the sandwich seller is coming to you? Okay, you have to lose something in, in that uh, converting something to another thing. So that's, that's why I call it is the law of the laws. I mean, it is true in everything. Even in your emotional relationship, you give something to get something. And in, in between, you lose. Always. Okay, if, if I am born, I don't have parents, okay, that's fine. But if I have parents and if I enjoyed having a parents, one day I will suffer when I lose them. So that's why I call it laws of the laws. It's not just a boring equation in a thermodynamic. It is every day's uh, law. I don't know you know this song or not, but this was for my student. It was a very famous song from Stig. It says that every breath you take, I don't know, have you heard about this? It's quite, uh, every move you make, every bond you break, in the, in the main song it says, I will be watching you, uh, but I change it a little bit to, those of thermodynamics will be watching you, <laughs> every move. So, this so used to be a famous sort of song, so that's why I called it laws of the law. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>